Let's understand the world a little better. I'm your host, Simon Wunderlich, and with me is Martin Plout. He's an academic, a journalist, and the author of several books on Africa, his latest one being Understanding Ethiopia's Tigray War. Today, we want to understand Ethiopia in general a little better. And with that, I want to dive right in and ask you, what key differences would you mention? What makes Ethiopia different from other African countries? What do we have to keep in mind? Well, it's uh, good to be with you and your audience. And I think the, I mean, it's a very good question because it is different. The Horn of Africa is different from the rest of Africa in a number of respects. First of all, uh, you know, unlike most of sub-Saharan Africa, but not, of course, including um, Egypt and uh, the North Africa, it has had a written language for many centuries. And as a result, it can go back through its own history, down the centuries, down the years, looking at their, their leaders, their emperors, their kings, their razes, as they called princes. And um, the vast and complicated history of the Horn of Africa, in which uh, sometimes Ethiopia has come out on top, sometimes it hasn't, it's, it's grown, it's shrunk. There are many, many fascinating elements to this. And of course, the fact that they have so many uh, ethnic groups and, of course, also major religions. So what are the most important ethnic groups you would mention there? Well, I suppose you, you'd have to begin with the two most important that were at the center of um, of what was called Abyssinia uh, in, in the old days. Uh, that, that's the highland region from which the rest of the country uh, grew. And uh, those are the uh, Tigrayans and the Amhara. And uh, today they, they make up a relatively small percentage of the population, um, of which has something like 80 plus eth ethnic ethnicities. Um, and the the uh, the largest ethnicity are the Aroma people. Uh, now the Aroma are divided between Christians and Muslims, but probably predominantly Muslim. While as the Tigrayans and the Amhara, although there are some uh, Muslims, there are most of them are Christians and Orthodox Christians who looked to uh, the Coptic Church in um, Alexandria as their lead, shall we say. Um, and uh, that is still true today. Do you have uh, percentage numbers round about how many Tigra uh, Tigrayans um, live in Ethiopia? It's, it's, it's a small number, maybe fewer than 10%, I mean, maybe 6%, something like that. So it, it, they're, they're a small number, um, but they have always played a very central role. Uh, I mean, some of the, and the most ancient churches are in their area, um, and some of the most important sites, both of battles, but also of palaces. I mean, the palaces in Aksum are some of the wonders of the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have these huge stelae, these uh, monuments in stone, which were cut out of the solid rock. And you can see where they were brought. Um, and they stand like pillars around the area. Some of them have fallen down now, of course. And I mean, how they were, were done. These were hundreds of years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Queen of Sheba's palace is there. I mean, the uh, in Tigray, you have the... the Ethiopians believe the Ark of the Covenant was taken there from Israel, where it was uh, where it was brought for sanctuary, and it is still, you know, there is a, a, an, an annual feast of Mariam, which people go to, and uh, they are they they extremely, um, uh, you know, reflective of it, and and, and they they worship outside it. They they're not allowed in, can't go into the church. Only the emperor and the priest that looks after it are allowed to go in and see the the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, That's interesting. It's, it's held in enormous um, respect by everybody. Um, and more recently, of course, there's also been a rise of um, evangelical Protestantism. So it's a comp very complicated story. Uh, you mentioned the highlands. What, what, in general, what does the geography of Ethiopia look like? Well, the north 
the center north of the country is is a highland um, kingdom uh, where it can get I mean, very substantial mountains. I mean, really huge. And it can get very cold up there. And then it falls away on all sides, uh, northwards to the sea. And uh, when the Ethiopian emperor was strong, he controlled uh, the routes to the sea and in, in the sea itself as well. I mean, at, at some times, the uh, Ethiopian empire extended, in fact, into Yemen. And uh, so it crossed the sea. Uh, and at, at, at other times when they were when they were divided and powerless, then it shrank back to its, its base. But really, in, in the late um, 19th century, two major emperors, Johannes and um, Menelik, Menelik II, expand the empire from being this highland region uh, into a much, much larger state. And they, they probably expand it by threefold. And uh, it happens at the same time as the scramble for Africa in the 1880s, um, where the other imperial powers were, you know, conquering bits of Africa. And uh, that is how they, they, it really, the current state of Ethiopia came to be in existence. And ever since then, there's been the question, really, of what sort of Ethiopia there should be. Because there are two conflicting views. The one says, once you're in Ethiopia, you're an Ethiopian. You, need, you can speak any language you like, you can have any culture you like, but you're an Ethiopian. The other view says, yeah, it's much more complicated than that. I'm a Tigran, I'm an Aroma, I'm a Somali. That's what I am first. And uh, this was, of course, made more difficult because the Amhara, who generally controlled the center, treated a lot of people terribly badly. And one shouldn't forget that uh, the Emperor Menelik was considered one of the greatest slave owners of all time. And he exported slaves from Ethiopia to Arabia, sold them off, and uh, particularly the Romo people still regard themselves as being treated as slaves. There is a word which I won't mention on air, but which is extremely rude, uh, which uh, is the way people used to describe the Aroma people, as if they were sort of naturally slaves. And uh, so, you know, it, the relationships between these groups has been difficult. There's been many, many, many wars. And, uh, you know, the, the war with Tigray was just the most recent. Hmm. Interesting. Um, are there... Have you ever been to Ethiopia? Oh, yes, I've been several times. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to go in recent times, partly because uh, I wrote a, an article when I worked for the BBC, which I retired from in 2013, um, which they didn't like. And uh, they not that they say no, it's just that they're never quite around getting around saying yes to a visa request. Hmm. Um were you able to uh, kind of see there maybe a different view on, I would say, the world in general, maybe, um, from the different ethnicities in um, Ethiopia? So yeah. a way that they think different? Well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they think differently, but they, they all have their own cultures. They all have their own traditions. And uh, as I said, there are many there are many languages, including some which are you know indigenous to the people of Ethiopia, you know the, which they which they they worship, and um, you know that that's it's a very complex uh, story and one I must say that you know is <laughs> to say one I would be an expert and it would be untrue, um, and then of course you have the relationship with the people of Eritrea who are to the north of. Um, Ethiopia and were carved out of Ethiopia by many powers, by the uh, the Ottoman Empire, by the Egyptians, by the Greeks, um, and then eventually in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, by the Italians. So they, they took a colony, like many other colonies. And the Eritreans then said, hang on, we are really have the same rights to independence as any other African state. And um, they, they were independent for a brief period under the Italians and then afterwards under the British, because Britain took 
Eritrea, when you may remember the Italians used uh, Eritrea as a staging board in the 1930s, 1935, to try and expand into Ethiopia under Mussolini. And uh, the fascists really wanted to make this the heart of a huge empire in the center of Africa, which would include Somalia, Somaliland, uh, and all sorts of other areas. That was their aim. And uh, in the end, they failed because the Ethiopians continued resisting, even though uh, Emperor Haile Selassie had to flee to Britain. And, um, you know, they did take the capital, Addis Ababa, but uh, the fight continued. And then Britain came in both from Somalia and through Sudan. And it went through Sudan into Eritrea. And Eritrea was under uh, British military administration for a good number of years, including after the war. But Britain didn't want it as a colony because they were getting rid of their colonies at that period. And they said in the end to the United Nations, well, you must decide what happens. We can't decide. Uh, and the, uh, they then went about um, having a plebiscite. Um, and, well, not a plebiscite, but a, you know, a, a hearing. The United Nations sent a team of of administrators who came around and said, well, what do you want? Which way should we go? And eventually they agreed that it should be part of, Air of Ethiopia, but as a part of a federation. And they were supposed mm -hmm. to have a considerable independence. And uh, Haile Selassie ended that in that status and just made it another province in 61. That was when the Eritreans said, right, that's it. We'll start fighting. And for 30 years, they fought for the independence, which they finally won by taking their capital, Asmara, in 1991. And when did when did Ethiopia become independent? Not from Eritrea, but uh, from from I think Italy then. No, Ethiopia was in a sense was never not independent because there were always parts of of Ethiopia which were not, um, which were not uh, held by the by the by the Italians. Uh, I mean, the the British came came through right in the early part of the of the war. I can't remember was it thirty nine or forty forty one. Uh, and and took it and ousted the the Italians, um, and there was terribly heavy fighting, particularly in Eritrea, but then other parts of, of the country. And as I say, they attacked from uh, three different areas, from from Sudan through Eritrea and through Somalia, and um, they returned uh, Haile Selassie to to their throne, to his throne. Uh, so, since there's so many different uh, groups in. Um... In Ethiopia, do they have uh, other? Do they have different rights? What What is the uh, situation in general of the form of government look like? But also um, of how the different groups get um, get treated, I guess, under um, under the under the government. Well, as I said, there are two different ways of looking at these things, and uh, under the Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, who was then ousted. Uh, because there was a terrible famine and a military government called the Derg, the military committee, uh, took power and in fact became uh, an ally of the Soviet Union. Uh, and the people of Tigray fought against that uh, because they saw that they also, like the Eritreans, had an element of a right to self-determination, whether that meant full independence or just a right to a federal status within Ethiopia. And they fought um, from the 1970s right through to 1991. And they had a difficult relationship with the Eritreans. Sometimes they worked with them against the, the Ethiopian state. Sometimes they worked against each other. But in 1991, the Eritrean liberation movement, the Eritrean People's Liberation Movement, marched into Asmara, their capital, and the Tigray People's Liberation Movement marched into Addis Ababa with Eritrean support. So for mm. one moment, there was this unity of these two chunks of Ethiopia that were fighting against the centralizing tendencies. And then Eritrea became an independent state with the United Nations. The United Nations held a referendum, in, and in 1993, it became a fully independent state and a member of the United of the UN and the African Union and all the rest of it. But the it was the Tigrayans that took control of um, Addis Ababa, and they ruled it 
until uh, uh, a few years ago, 2018. So from 1993 to 2018, the Tigrayans hold the reins of power in Ethiopia with other groups, but essentially they were the ones in control. And they then brought in a different kind of constitution. They said we must have a federal structure and there is what they imposed what was called ethnic federalism. So they grouped, I think, various ethnicities and each one then had their separate rights to self-determination up to and including independence, um, a bit along the model that Stalin brought in in the Soviet Union. And uh, it was a complete shift of power from the center to the regions, except behind the scenes, the Tigrans, you, you would not be surprised, managed to set up sort of front parties which were pretty pro them. So uh, they still managed to control things, even though in principle they'd given away power. And that ended then 2018. The uh, Tigrans are, are leave power, they are pushed out, and um, the current prime minister comes in, Prime Minister Abiy, who is himself half Oromo and half um, Amhara. And that is the moment when things move towards the war that we've just seen. How can it be that these Tigrayans, that the Tigrayans are so, or became so powerful if they're so few? I mean, you said under 10% of the population. Well, they were, you know, one of the two great traditional uh, powers in, in Ethiopia with the, with the Amhara. They had traditionally been the rulers of, of Ethiopia. They had both both the Amhara and the uh, Tigrayans, both of whom are minorities, had supplied the, uh, you know, the, the, through their nobility, had provided the, uh, the, uh, the royal families and the emperors of, um, of Ethiopia. So there was nothing surprising about that. Um, and they, they controlled the, the center I suppose, just in the same way, for example, as the um, the Tutsi controlled Rwanda. You know, it's uh, they're again a minority. They often are minorities that control countries, even if they are um, small minorities. So the other groups were following them, then, or not all, but following is is a bit strong. <laughs> but they, I, I mean, uh, if they were totally against uh, their their rule, then something would have happened, not. Well, for example, in in one of the elections, uh, I think it was two thousand and three. There was a uh, an election where the Tigrans actually lost power in um, in uh, the capital in Addis Ababa, and uh, and perhaps in other parts of the country. And certainly in Addis Ababa, the the opposition would were absolutely clear that they had won. And uh, but when the results came out, uh, they hadn't quite won. And there were huge demonstrations which were forcibly repressed. Um, and a lot of people went into exile, fled into exile. And uh, that, that was the Tigrayans just, you know, using the power of the state and the power of the military and the power of the security forces, as I'm afraid happens all too often in Africa, to, to, control, uh, to control the country. And they laid a lot of the seeds for the current conflict um, at that time. Um, what other allies you mentioned the uh, Soviet Union um, back in the days in uh, Eritrea for some time at least uh, what other allies um, were involved in the conflict well if we're talking about the, the war that broke out in um, you know, a couple of years ago then we're, then we're talking about three major forces you have the uh, the Ethiopian military, the Eritrean army, and about between five and ten thousand Somalis who who went to Eritrea and were brought in with, by the Eritreans, plus a very substantial number of ethnic forces, uh, ethnic militia, who had been brought up by the Tigrayans in a sense, in the system they, they had of ethnic federalism, they all, each of the federation, or each of the bits of the federation, had their own security forces, security police, really, but they, were, they became you know, paramilitary forces. And those 
They also supported Prime Minister Abiy. Uh, and you got an alliance, really, which was really ruled from, uh, really controlled from Asmara, the Eritrean capital, and from Addis Ababa. And that is where, you know, these things actually, how, how this came about and how you got this huge attack um, on the night of the 3rd and the 4th of November um, on the, uh, on Tigray. And why were the, um, why were they supporting uh, Ethiopia then, or the Tigrays? Um, for example, the, I think, uh, did you say Somalia or Somaliland that w was an ally? Well, why did they support them? Well, I, I don't think it was so much Somalia. It was the Somali president who was known as Farmaggio. Uh, who uh, saw ha having a good relationship with with uh, President Isaias of, of Eritrea as being a way forward. And he sent his troops in there to um, go and fight. And uh, they were trained and then they were put into the field. I mean, it wasn't the Somali people. The Somali people have no quarrel with the people of Tigray or people of, of, of anywhere else. In fact, the, the, the Somali people have always been Uh, I mean, the I don't know if you know this, but the, the Somali flag has a five-pointed star on it. And the five points of the star are Somalia, Somaliland, Djibouti, the Somali region of, of Ethiopia, and northern Kenya. And that is what Somalis actually claim. So the Somalis claim a huge chunk of um, eastern Ethiopia, which was swallowed up, as I said, under... President uh, Menelik uh, in the late 19th century when it was seized. So they, they still speak Somali and many of them still think that they should be uh, Somalis. But, there, you know, there have been wars about this. And I've, I've actually sat on tanks uh, <laughs> that were sort of abandoned tanks we, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Somali region, which are, you know, it's a very desert-like desert region. And They still, they just sit there. Nothing happens. Uh, them and the camels. So that is still uh, something that they want to, they, they still want to um, take control of these countries, Somalia now being? Well, Somalia would like to. I mean, ideally, I mean, they don't raise it very often, but it's certainly part of their culture that, you know, if you're a Somali, if you're a Somali, you're a Somali, and it's, that's the end of it, really. Um And, uh, you know, they just think, I mean, it's a bit like, you know, why did Germany uh, under Hitler, I mean, I'm not making a comparison, but I'm just saying, you know, why did Germany under Hitler say, well, all the people of that were spread across Central Europe who were German speakers, that they should come together? There's always an element of that amongst people, you know, even if, and I'm not trying to say that the Somalis are, are, are Nazis, huh? but I'm, I'm just okay. saying, you know, that you, you can always whip this up. Okay, but it still stands. That's That was my question. Um, yeah, not absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, domestically in Ethiopia, what are the uh, biggest actors uh, in terms of media? Let's start with media, just, just media. Who are the biggest um, media houses and how is media in general um, controlled, I would say? Well, it is, it is pretty tightly controlled. I mean, most of the television stations are run by the, the government, but the, there are very good uh, independent journalists in, in uh, Ethiopia and, uh, you know, the Standard and uh, the Reporter and the Ethiopian Reporter. They, they, they do a really excellent job in, um, in reporting events in Ethiopia. And a lot of their, their reporters have been put in jail very frequently. But still, the news does get out. And in that, they are very different, for example, from neighboring Eritrea, which uh, has absolutely nothing but uh, government propaganda. There is not a single word that is spoken on any Eritrean media, which, which could be considered independent. So people do know what's going on in Ethiopia, but in Eritrea, you have to find out by asking your neighbor. But does does that word uh, maybe come through over the border? Like what what uh, the, the yeah, uh, news sources from Ethiopia? Well, no, no, it doesn't. I mean, have you ever known a situation where people don't share information? And of course, now where we have 
you know, phones and WhatsApp and Skype and all the rest of it, uh, you know, people find ways of, of getting information across. And, you know, I mean, Eritreans, for example, and uh, Ethiopians don't, particularly the Highlanders, see themselves as this, you know, not very different from each other. I mean, they, they're all Orthodox Christians, mostly. I mean, there are, you know, substantial numbers of lowland Eritreans who are Muslim and perhaps make up half the population. Um, but, you know, the it's the same as in, in Ethiopia. You know, the, the Highlanders see themselves as really one, one people. They intermarry. They have done so for centuries and centuries. They all know each other. Uh, in terms of the, the next actor, uh, corporations, uh, what does Ethiopia export or what, in general, what makes uh, the major part of their GDP? Well, I mean, they have been big exporters of things down the years, of things like hides, um, some grains. Uh, they don't have major uh, mineral exports, really. Um, I mean, more recently, I mean, they've just started, the, they've, they've dammed the, uh, the Nile, the Blue Nile, the great, uh, it's called GERD, uh, great uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is what's, what it's called, which was an amazing achievement because it's very close to the, the Sudanese border. It's purely hydroelectric. And uh, it was subscribed not by donations from the World Bank or IMF or Britain or France or whoever, but um, essentially uh, local people just paid the money They're out of their own salaries. I mean, sometimes with a bit of arm twisting, but uh, they paid their own money to build this huge dam. I mean, they got some support from the Chinese who helped with, I think, with the generators. But it's their dam, and they're going to make a lot of money out of it by selling the electricity both inside Ethiopia, where people are going to be electrified where they didn't have it before, and also um, into Sudan, uh, if Sudan quietens down a bit. Um, this has all been very controversial because the Egyptians are worried that they'll, they only have the Nile as a source of water, and um, so they've been worried that they're going to lose their water supplies. But there is really little chance that will happen because uh, it's it's a purely a hydroelectric scheme. So uh, electricity and um, what other major corporate uh, other what what makes the corporate world of uh, Ethiopia? Well, I mean, they, they have a, a big services sector. Ethiopian Airlines is possibly the best airline in Africa. Very well respected, um, although played a substantial role in the war in ferrying some of the troops around. Uh, but I mean, a very, very well organized uh, airline. I mean, I'd be happy to fly on it any time. Um, and I wouldn't say that about every African airline. There's some gold, um, you know, but you know, not not huge quantities. Um, and then, of course, one of the big exports that they have, and uh, also the Eritreans is the uh, are there their own citizens living abroad the diaspora who send back substantial sums of money mm -hmm. to their family and uh, are very very useful in in supporting them both financially and politically um how would you predict the the future of epo with ethiopia when it comes to um when it comes to their governance um Do you see a change there? You know, I'm afraid I've been around long enough to stop predicting the future. It's a complete waste of time. I mean, I didn't think that uh, President Trump would win. I didn't think that the Berlin Wall would fall. And as a South African or a, somebody of South African origin, I thought apartheid would last all my lifetime, I'm afraid. I was wrong about all of those things. So why are you asking me about the future? It's just impossible to know. Okay, okay. Um, but are there any, um, currently, are, are there any, um, no, I would say, not alternatives, but are there any um, trends that you might see that are current? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are, uh, I mean, the, the war in Tigray, which was so devastating and, you know, cost maybe 600, maybe more, 800,000 lives, we don't know. Um, it was unfortunately the Ethiopian government has blocked 
a, a real investigation which the United Nations had set up to try and investigate what was happening. That's, that was blocked and will never, never take place, I'm afraid. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, the, the whole thrust of the situation was that the Tigrayans really lost the war. I mean, they, they managed to hold out. The uh, Ethiopians didn't, and the Eritreans, and the other forces didn't manage to actually take the Tigrayan capital, Mekele, twice. They took it once, but were pushed out, and they didn't take it a second time. And, um, a, and a deal was made in both in Pretoria, in South Africa, and then in, in, Ken, in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, which was supposed to sort of pave the way forward for a peace uh, which was, would resolve everything. But, for example, the Eritreans, although having been part of the war, were not included in the deal. Uh, and uh, so they remain in parts of Ethiopia and nobody's been able to get rid of them. Uh, there are large parts of Western Tigray, which border on Sudan, which are still inhabited by the Amhara people who claimed it as their own. Uh, and that's a, a matter of conflict between the Tigrayans and the Amhara. And we just can't know where that is, you know, how will that be resolved? We just don't know. But at the time of the war, the Amhara were very much in favour of Prime Minister Abiy. Now there's been a big falling out and he's gone in really heavily and crushed uh, the, uh, the Amhara fighters. Um, and is, is occupying parts of it. There's still a lot of fighting with the Oromo people, uh, which has been going on now for many decades. So it's a very unstable situation. Uh, I mean, how it's going to re resolve itself, uh, you know, who knows? Um, but, you know, you can sort of see the elements that, are, that, that could be brought into play. Um, and the Eritreans are still have, a, as I say, a major say in, in what goes on in Ethiopia. What would you say are Ethiopia's opportunities for the futures? What are advantages that they may hold or how they can capitalize on these? Well, they really, their, their biggest advantage really is their, their status in the Horn of Africa. Because they've always been regarded by the, um, the West in particular. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the United States, uh, you know, as the key linchpin in the whole of the Horn of Africa. And the, the same is true, really, for, um, shall we say, Britain, which was the home, uh, provided a home and refuge for uh, the Emperor Haile Selassie during the Second World War. Uh, and so it's one of the reasons why when the going got tough, the West has always sided with um, Ethiopia rather than uh, then with Eritrea, for example, who who had a completely legitimate claim uh, at the end of the ninety eight to two thousand war, that uh, parts of the um, of the border which which had been they, the fight had been about uh, were awarded to them, and uh, the Ethiopians just said yes, I know we signed up to that, but mm, don't think so, and uh, they never handed over the uh, parts of the border they should have. I mean, there were parts that went one way, parts which went the other way. So, and the the Eritrean said to the, to the West, well, why don't you, you know, you were there at the, the signing. You, come on, it's time for you to, to put pressure on Addis. And the West would never really do it because they, they see the centrality of Ethiopia at the heart of the Horn of Africa. And if Ethiopia fell apart, I mean, the ripples for Kenya, for Somalia, for Sudan, for of Eritrea, Djibouti are just too enormous and nobody wants to see it. I mean, the, the, the Ethiopia has always, in a sense, been a, a rock in the heart of, of, of that part of Africa. And that's the way in which they want it to continue. And don't forget, you have things like Al-Shabaab, which is, uh, you know, an offshoot of um, these, uh, you know, the, the Taliban in um, fighting in Somalia and they haven't been defeated. They, they've been pushed back a bit, but they're still still there. And the, although the Americans have put troops and supplies in, uh, it is by far, far from over. 
So, uh, you know, they do not want to have yet another part of the world, I mean, especially part of Africa, which is so unstable already. I mean, if you look at the number of coups that have been in places like Mali, Niger, uh, they don't want another area of instability. So in the end, they always come down in their favour. The other thing is that because of its location on the Red Sea, or I mean, all Ethiopia is not directly on the Red Sea, but it's in the area and, you know, has big, you know, big say in the region. Um, both the people in uh, the, both the Arabs, particularly the United Arab Emirates, see the utility of having a good relationship with um, with Addis Ababa. And then, of course, you have the Chinese who are big lenders to um, uh, to Ethiopia, who've put in a, a modernized the uh, the railway line to the sea in Djibouti, and uh, have put in a lot of uh, modern transport systems and, and investments, but they want their money back. It's part of their, uh, you know, the modernized Silk Route, um, you know, which is the way that they see the world. So they see they're getting something out of it. And then they're the, the Russians who have been, uh, had good relations with Eritrea, I mean, Eritrea was one of the first and only countries in Africa to vote in favor of the Russian position over the over Ukraine. They didn't abstain. They voted for Russia. And uh, there have been even suggestions that Russia would get a, a base in, in Eritrea. It hasn't happened, but that could always happen. So you can see everybody sort of thinks they'd like to have a, a bit of the, the region, uh, the only part which it really does, people do have a part of, is Djibouti, where the French have a base, the uh, Chinese, the Indians, um, and, and you know, they all operate from, from there, and other people might want to do so as well. So you, you can see it, it's, especially on the, on the supply lines through, uh, from the Middle East through to the Suez Canal and to, to, um, to Europe. It's, it is a, a really important, um, shall we say, area for the world. And that's why everybody takes it so seriously and wants to make sure that, that particularly the Ethiopians stay on their side. Later on, we will have a rapid fire question, uh, uh, some rapid fire questions. So, um, but I want to, one question from those I want to ask now, and that is, um, How would you spend ten billion dollars to make Ethiopia a better place? Ten billion. Ten billion, yes. Well, uh, um, I think the, the, that uh, I would give them to the people. Give it to the people. In Directly small, to the people. Directly. Okay. People and see what they did with it. It'd be really interesting to see what people did, rather than trying to. You know, build this or through the state. I would go directly to the people. Okay, that's done. Oh, interesting. See what happens. Okay. Um, what would you say are the best uh, sources to learn and inform oneself about uh, Ethiopia? Obviously, your books. Um, other than that, where can I um, maybe stay up to date with current news? Well, I mean, I would uh, actually, funny enough, Twitter is not a bad uh, source if you follow the right people, but then you have to know who to follow. And that's, that's a bit of a circular argument. Um, I, I think that Ethiopia Insight uh, has an excellent, it's, it's run by uh, William Davidson, who does a really, really good job in, uh, in talking about current issues. Uh, the crisis group, International Crisis Group, does good briefings on it. Um, and then, you know, as I say, the uh, look at the, uh, the Ethiopian, uh, you know, Addis, uh, based papers, and many of them have websites and, uh, you, it's not difficult to, to keep up with them. And of course the, the major organization like the BBC, Reuters, AFP, uh, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera to some really good, um, in-depth documentaries. I would just follow the, the normal um, the normal sources that any journalist would use if they're trying to get on to, on top of it. I mean, there are good books on on uh, on 
Ethiopia. I mean, many of them, I mean, forget about my ones. I don't want to push my own books. But, uh, you know, there are there are good books that have been written on it. And it's it's actually a very well understood um, part of the world. I mean, much better than 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 some other parts of Africa. Now, you're obviously an expert um, on Africa and especially Horn. Um, if you were to analyze or start new with a different area, let's say, I don't know, somewhere in Asia, for example, or um, South America, how would you go about um, that? What would your process look like? How would you go about that? Where would you start in trying to understand? Well, I, I had to do that because uh, the BBC sent me to India to um to basically do a half hour daily program a current affairs program news and current affairs program from india well you do what you what what every journalist does is you go there you talk to people for a, for a couple of weeks and uh then you you hire local uh, lo local journalists and you rely on good local journalists that's the way to get going i mean you Just speak to the people. It's not hard to find out what's going on in a country. I mean, there are some countries where you really can't do it because people are so frightened of what's happening. I mean, Eritrea is extremely difficult to get to know because the the the, the uh, uh, secret police operate almost like the Stasi did in East Germany, and it's really hard. Like, no, it's they call it the North Korea of, of of the Horn of Africa, and it's a bit like that. It's quite hard to do it there, but everywhere else in in Africa or I mean, when, you know, I, I traveled through Vietnam, I, you know, I, it's not difficult to see what, see what's going on. You talk to people, trust people. People will what, tell you what's going on. What questions do you ask then? Yeah, everything. You start with, you always start with culture. Start with always food. start with culture? Start with food. food. Start with music. Start with, um, you know, where do, where do you go for, for your, uh, to have a good time, uh, you know? You start with basic questions like that. You can all easily then build up from it. But once you have an idea, and once people trust you and see that you're not trying to get something out of them, uh, buy them a beer. You know, sit down and chat to people. It's it's not that difficult to to understand. I mean, the hardest country I ever had to try and learn about was India, because India is difficult beyond belief, because you you don't just have left right you know, political issues with the, you know, in, 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 in the government. And then, of course, at all the state levels, some of which are contradict the, the center, um, you then have uh, the Hindu, non-Hindu divide, which is massively powerful. I mean, people in the north speak Hindi. People in the south would rather spit blood than speak, than speak Hindi. They'd rather speak English, which is why English is what the other ma major language. Um, you get the divide between the Hindus and the Muslims, which is tremendously difficult. And, and of course, there are other religions there which have nothing to do with, with, with that. And then you have color. I mean, it, it's not talked about very much, but when my uh, friend had a baby, he, he was European, she was Indian. The first thing her, her, her mother, who was an Indian, said, To when she saw this first baby, what a beautiful Wheaton complexion. That was the first thing she said. Not she's healthy, it was the color of her skin. And, you know, that, that huh. is still a big issue. In, and, but they didn't, nobody talks about it. And then you get, of course, caste, which is a tremendously divisive issue. Now, you try and understand all of those things plus politics. It's a mishmash. It's really hard to understand. That was difficult. I think I vaguely understood a bit of it after a year, but I would never say I'd <laughs> I'll go now over to the uh, rapid... Or wait, let me first ask you, is there anything else you want to add? Or um, is there something I should have asked you that I didn't before we go to the uh, second not, segment? Not really, except that, uh, you know, the the Ethiopian people, apart from... I, I talked about their, the depth of their culture and how it goes back over so many centuries. And it's not just Christianity. I mean, the were some of the first Muslims who fled from persecution in in uh, in Arabia uh, came across the Red Sea and found sanctuary in, um, in fact, in Tigray and built mosques up there, which are some of the oldest in Africa. So, you know, there is this huge sense of, 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 of religious and cultural 
life which which people can draw upon um and then they are tremendously uh capable uh, as as a peop as peoples um of getting going and i mean you only have to look at how well the ethiopians have done in shall we say the united states where they're already doing well and are being elected to public office uh in various parties um and the same is happening in 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 britain uh where they are beginning to come through and uh i mean a, a, a friend of mine uh, an eritrean uh, i know he's eritrean but he could easily easily have been ethiopian um actually negotiates for britain in the area of chemicals and technology uh so i mean they you know they can hold their own against anybody good um okay now for the for the uh, rapid fire questions i will um please ask you to answer in a round about two three sentences so rather shortly um okay are you ready yes If you had a big poster, let's say on Times Square, everybody would see it in the middle of the city. What would you put on it? What would you write on it? Come to the Horn of Africa, the most beautiful part of the world. Do you have a favorite quote? From Ethiopia? No. Not necessarily, no. In general, a favorite quote. <laughs> All right. I'll give you one. Uh... Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. A controversial opinion. I believe what nobody else does, or no, almost nobody else. Not really. Uh, you know, I'm a journalist, so I try to keep my opinions out of things. I mean, there are things I like and that I don't like, but um, I don't have enormously controversial <laughs> views. I try not to. Sorry, you don't need to have one. <laughs> um, what would you have liked to know when you started? Let's say with 20. If I was 20, what I would like yes. to know is that I'm never going to get to the end of the road of exploring where I'm going. That is good. That is beautiful. Um, what's your newest biggest insight? I'm sorry? What is your newest, biggest insight? <laughs> well, I'm writing a book on, on African slavery. And my biggest insight, which was a complete surprise to me, was that in, at the time of the American Civil War in 1860, there were about four million slaves in America. At exactly the same time, in the Sokoto Caliphate, which is in Niger, northern Nigeria, There were at least as many, if not more. <laughs> wow. You know, I didn't... Um, oh, wait, wait, we already had that one. Um, then I think that does it. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Great for pleasure. everybody who... For everybody who wants to know more about uh, his insights and ideas of uh, on Eth Ethiopia or of Ethiopia in general and the Tigray War, get his latest book, um, Understanding Ethiopia's Tigray War. You also wrote books on uh, South Africa, on uh, Eritrea. Um, check them out. And uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Nice to be with you. <laughs>